When I was 20, I encountered the most unusual stranger I have ever met, and most likely ever will. I'm 35 now, a whole 15 years after a brief encounter which I cannot imagine myself ever forgetting. I guess the reason for that is this one idea that has tormented my mind ever since. The idea of what if. The stranger put in perspective for me the idea of what if, which I admit had never much concerned me before our conversation. For example, if you slept through your alarm one morning and were late getting to the airport, only to discover that you had missed your flight. A what-if scenario might occur to you when you later learned that your intended flight crashed into the Atlantic and left no survivors. In the following decades, you would get married, have kids, and maybe live to a rotten old age. But you would never quite forget that what-if. What if I'd been on that plane? What if I had just as easily died some 50 years ago? In this way, it is understandable why the what-if scenario is so troubling, and why no one talks about it. The truth is that a what-if is not scary or sad so much as it is disturbing, because the reality is that you might not be the same or even alive had circumstances been different. It is easy to ignore events that never happened, but what if they had? The thought is present. It infects your mind, not like fear or grief, but like a whisper. And then you realize that perhaps somewhere, in a parallel universe, you are in fact just a skeleton who has been sitting placidly at the bottom of the ocean for half a century, seaweed gently rippling between your ribs. Such was not a thought that occurred to 20-year-old Thomas Wells. I remember the day clearly. I was waiting on a bench for the campus bus. The sky was pearly white, heavily overcast. The scene remained surreal in my mind because no one and no thing cast a shadow. The sunlight was evenly diffused. I was still an undergrad with a pep in my step, shuffling along the long road that was my engineering degree. The bus was going to take me to my calculus class, which I often dreaded, but I always made sure to get to the bus stop early, just in case. I glanced at my watch and realized with a little shock that I was 15 minutes early, which I hadn't really anticipated. It was alright, I had plenty to think about. That night, for instance. My girlfriend at the time, Rachel Waters, was going to an off-campus graduation party at Mike's place and told me I ought to come along. I didn't know Mike real well, but several of my friends were going. It would be a fun time, Rachel had assured. I agreed. At the very least, we could get a little alcohol and loosen up a bit. That was when I noticed him, the man across the street. To this day... I don't know what direction he came from. All I know is that when I looked up from my paperback novel, he was crossing the street with his hands in his trouser pockets. He was wearing a tan overcoat with a sweater vest underneath and a scruffy white beard on his wrinkled face. He looked about 70, but he must have been younger. His sad eyes gave an illusion of age that I thought might have been false. When he reached my side of the street, he sat wordlessly on the bench, which was too small to leave a comfortable space between us. I cleared my throat and shifted my legs, pretending to read my book, but not quite making sense of the words. At last, he turned to me and said, Are you Thomas? This time I did look up. He gazed into my eyes with his sad ones, a crease formed between two furrowed brows. My stomach gave a lurch. I had a fleeting thought that this guy might be a homeless man, a druggie, begging for money. 
but there was something about him that seemed too intelligent. And he said my name. How does he know my name? Yes, I said finally. Then, have we met before? The old man looked at his shoes, gave a small chuckle. I suppose we have. Only once. I waited for him to elaborate, but he didn't. If you've got a moment, Thomas, I'd like to share my story with you. I won't take long, though it's been on my heart to do this for quite some time. Great, I thought. Now sure that this man was some sort of street preacher. I was no stranger to religion, but I had not the time nor the interest to listen to his life story. I looked around, embarrassed by the strange interaction. But there was only a handful of students milling about, and none of them seemed interested in looking our way. Please, prompted the old man. Still, there was something about the way he was staring at me that compelled me to pay attention. And I told myself that once the bus came, I'd excuse myself and get away from him. So I gave him my attention. That book you're reading, said the man. I've read it before, long ago. Don't worry, I won't tell you how it ends. But you've read the beginning, yes? I nodded. Chapter 1 ends with Mark losing everything. His girl, his friends, his job. I guess that was me at one point. Sir, if you need money, I... No, 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 said the old man, waving his hands. I don't want your money. I want you to listen to me, Thomas. That much is important. I wished he would stop saying my name. It was unsettling, because the more I thought about it, the more convinced I became that I had never seen this man in my life. The point is, I lost everything. A long time ago. I made some poor decisions. One poor decision, really. And I want more than anything to make it right. But that's in the past, you understand? There's no use crying over spilled milk. The man looked out over the street, squinting. I used to be a lot like you, Thomas. I just don't want you to make the same mistake. What mistake? I asked. The man was quiet for a long time. Finally, he said. You got a girlfriend, Thomas? I thought about Rachel and how we'd been together since our early high school days. I wouldn't have gone to the same college if it hadn't been for her. Well, yes. Yeah? So did I, back in the day. I loved her too, you bet I did. Probably would have gotten married. But she was taken from me. He looked back at me with his sad eyes. And I suddenly wish he had it. She died. We were together at this apartment, you see. But she was at the front of the building, and I was in another room. And all of a sudden, there's this massive explosion. Like a cannon went off. Maybe about 50 at once. Right next to my head. All I know is that I couldn't hear anything after that for a good while. And then I stumbled back into the living space to see what had happened. The floor and most of the front wall were gone altogether boiler explosion. And once the dust cleared, I could see her down in that pit, just lying there, hardly recognizable as the person she had been. You think seeing the people you love die is going to be some sentimental scene, Thomas. But let me tell you, that was not. 
she was charred beyond all repair. One eye open, one eye out, her skin missing in some places, and muscle gone in others. I doubt her own parents would have recognized that face. But I did, see, and it haunted me for years. Haunted you? Yeah, I'd see her in my nightmares. That was a face I couldn't get away from, not even with a liberal amount of alcohol. And you bet I relied on that stuff once she was gone. As a matter of fact, I became something of an alcoholic. The habit followed me for decades. Eventually, it cost me my job. I'm sorry to hear that, I said, no longer thinking about my own time, but completely enthralled by this stranger's story. The two of us were silent. We watched cars and students pass back and forth. Of course, said the old man quietly. I was several years out of college at the time, and losing my job was just about the worst thing that could happen to me. Sunk in debt, with such little job experience that it was near impossible to find a new one. The economy was rough, the jobs that I did find didn't pay well, and I kept hopping to new ones. At one point, I worked four jobs, you know that? Just to keep my head above water. You never married? I said, not intending to be rude, but honestly curious. Never tried, shrugged the man. Who would want to? God doesn't have the time or the money to raise a family. What girl would want him? So, the only girl you ever dated was in college? That's right. And I had every intention on keeping it that way. And Thomas, you want to know why? Because every time another young gal comes along with an interest in you, all you see is that charred, mangled face staring right back at you from the boiler pit. And you tell yourself you can't let it happen again. Yeah, she was the only one for me. By the time I was settled into a career, I had very little money and a bad alcohol addiction. My old high school and college friends had long since abandoned me, partially because I harassed them for money and favors, and partially because I became an awful person to be around. My mom was suffering from old age, and I wish I could tell you she died that way, quiet and peaceful, but she was the second person to be taken from me. It was my college girlfriend all over again car crash. I had been locked up for public intoxication, and she was coming to visit me. The man stared at the passing cars, but he wasn't really seeing them. I could tell he was far off somewhere, somewhere else. The pain was visible, but he never once choked up. I, I don't know what to say. I said. I did it. You don't need to say anything, boy. The old man seemed to come back to reality, and he turned to look at me again. His voice was strong now. That's what this is all about. Don't feel sorry for me. I just need you to understand. I need you to understand that these things happen to me because of one mistake. One mistake that led to a whole chain of events. A butterfly effect which, had I avoided this mistake, could have changed my entire life for the better. But what mistake is that? I implored, utterly impatient. The bus had rounded the corner and was hissing to a stop. What mistake do you want me to avoid? 
The old man sighed deeply. I guess you've already avoided it, to be honest. In time, you will come to understand. The bus doors folded open, and I stood up, quite eagerly. The old man seized my upper arm before I could board. Thomas, listen to me. He breathed, so desperate that I was suddenly afraid. You have a calculus exam in two days, do you not? The question was so odd that it caught me off guard. How, how did you know? There's no time to explain. The exam is important, do you understand? It's very important, and you need to do very well. As of right now, you have a C in the class, but Thomas, if you waste this test, that grade will improve. Make your mother proud, please. I wish I could. Let go. This guy wasn't making any sense, and his apparent knowledge of my personal life suddenly scared me. Annoyed by his insistence, and a little unnerved, I jerked away from his arm and climbed the steps. Thomas, please, do you understand me? You must do well on this test. It is very imp... That was the last I heard of the old man before the doors hissed shut and I was left alone in the bus with everyone staring at me. I took a seat and as the bus pulled away, I spied on the old man through the window, watching as he grew smaller and smaller with distance. He just stood there, hands balled into fist, watching me get away. Then we turned the corner and he was gone. For the rest of the day, I thought long and hard about what the old man had told me. In retrospect, I hadn't even gotten his name. If I had, such a detail might be important to inform the authorities, but somehow I found myself unable to call the police. Maybe it was ridiculous, but I knew somewhere within myself that his knowledge of my life had been justified. There was not a madman behind those eyes, but rather someone who had endured a great deal of hardship. His insistence upon my good grades was surely a well-meaning warning against his own regrets, or so I thought. I reminded myself that I could not end up like that, not me, because I had so much going for me. But that had been his point, hadn't it? that no matter what, one wrong mistake could lead to another mistake, and another, and another. To what end did the rabbit trail go, I wondered, that would cause an elderly man to forewarn total strangers. But you're not strangers. He said he'd met you once before. Of one thing I was certain. We had never met. He was a loon, I concluded. He had been right about one thing, though. I had a calculus exam in two days, and I would probably fail if I continued to practice the same negligent study habits. Regardless of the old man's mental state, he sure had kicked me into high gear about this exam, which was apparently of god-tier importance. I studied for the rest of the day. In fact, I studied so diligently that I almost forgot about the graduation party and surely would have if it had not been for Rachel's phone call. It was only when I started talking to her that I realized how tired I was. I told her I might not even go to the party. I would rather just stay in and study. She was disappointed, of course. She said she didn't want to go if I didn't, and that she'd like to see me, if that was possible. We were taking the same calculus class, so I suggested she come over for dinner, and maybe a little study date. And Rachel said that would be nice, and we agreed on a time and hung up. 
That night, we studied calculus instead of going to the party, at times having more fun than math, and at some late hour, we parted ways. And for the next day or so, I wondered a lot about the old man, but told no one about him, not even Rachel, though she did seem curious about my sudden studying hobby. My conversation with that man seemed almost private, almost dreamlike, and I nearly convinced myself it had not actually happened. That is, until my mother called me, sobbing that thank God I was okay. When I finally calmed her enough to ask what on earth she was on about, everything made sense. The previous night, the night of the graduation party, Mike's apartment exploded at 11.34 p.m. due to an overheated boiler. The phone fell from my face. This changed everything. I don't remember much about that day. I remember running down to the dorm's front steps in my robe and snagging the first local newspaper I could get my hands on. I didn't have to look very far. It was the front page news. Apartment boiler explosion kills 24, more injured, read the headline. In the coming hours, I learned that several of my friends had been killed and perhaps I was the only one who knew just how close Rachel and I had come. I was the only one who knew that we should have been there. So I should have been the one staring at her flaming corpse. She should have died, but she didn't. I never told Rachel just how lucky she was to be alive. That she figured out all on her own when she, too, read the local newspaper and dissolved into tears. Maybe that was when I realized just how much I loved her. It took a few years, but after we were both graduated, we decided to get married. That is, to date, the best decision of my life, second only to studying for calculus. I found a great job working at an aerospace engineering company, and Rachel supported me all the way. My success at the company brought in a heavy paycheck, and though it took time away from my family, I rarely felt the urge to touch a drop of alcohol. I wish I could say everything made sense from the moment I laid my eyes on that newspaper headline, but in truth, it didn't for some years to come. I spent many sleepless nights thinking about that old man, theorizing and then criticizing my theories. I knew who he was, I thought, but a piece of the puzzle was still missing. A piece that turned up, as I knew it would, later in my life, some 15 years after the boiler incident. A man by the name of Scott Willows called me up out of the blue. Scott was an old high school friend, who we had never quite parted ways. He made his living as a theoretical physicist, and it was Scott's eccentric phone call that requested my engineering assistance for a particular project, one which he claimed might revolutionize modern scientific thought. That was quite the statement, I thought. The next day, Scott showed me his model for temporal displacement, a theory which was above my comprehension, but in layman's terms sounded astonishing. Impossible, really. But it couldn't have been impossible. Because I knew Scott's theory was a success. It was the missing piece. Because I knew Scott's theory was a success. It was the missing puzzle piece. And in that instant, I knew what I had to do. I had to stop Rachel and myself from attending that party. I had to save us the way the old man had saved us. I'm 35 now, but Scott's theory is well underway. As of now, it is being critiqued, refined, and soon will be tested. 
and until the opportunity arrives, I will wait patiently, because I know my plan will work. I know it will work because it has already worked, and it is now up to me to complete the circle. To this day, I am haunted by what might have been. What if the man had not visited me? What if I had gone to the party instead? And what if that newspaper headline had read 25 killed instead of 24? An old man once told me the answer to all these questions, and it is that which haunts me most. But there is one thing of which I am absolutely certain. When the prospect of turning back time has become a reality, I will pay myself a visit and stop what terrors might have been. Hey everyone, I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you want to see more, let me know in the comments below, and tell me what you thought of this narration. Make sure to follow me on Twitter for updates, and if you'd like to get early videos, shoutouts, and much much more, I'd appreciate it if you check out my Patreon page. It's a place where you can help support my channel while getting awesome rewards in the process, and every pledge helps out a ton, no matter the size. So if you'd like to see all the rewards I offer and consider becoming a patron, it'd mean a ton to me if you'd click the link in the description and just check it out. And don't forget to show some love to the amazingly talented authors who make these narrations possible. Have a good night everybody. Cheers.